많은 선수들이 성적이 안 나오면 많이 힘들어 하잖아요. 근데 저는 그런 거에 연연하는 스타일이 아니기 때문에 저는 성적이 안 나와도 이제 뭐 잘할 수 있겠지 그런 마음가짐으로 되게 행복하게, 행복하게 살았어요. 언제, 언제까지 잘 되겠지 그런 마음으로, 그런 마인드로 살았죠. 저는. 제가 얼마 전에 첫 우승컵을 들어, 들어 올렸는데 그 맛을 또 느끼기 위해서 다시 한번 우승 한번 해보고 싶어요. 할수 있을 때더 열심히 하자 이런 생각이 들어서 지금 매 순간에 좀더 최선을 다해야겠다는 생각을 하게 돼요. 하는 대회마다 좀 우승이 목표가 계속 바꿨고 이번에 우승하면 2회 우승이라고 우승하고 싶어요. To me, Casper Cup is important because I can finally show myself against Korean players because from the entirety of my career where I've actually been a good player it's been when I've only been playing foreigners. So like it's all been region lock tournaments. So now I can finally show like how good I am against actual Koreans and like top level play. I'm definitely a macro player. I just like to play my game once I can get into my comfort zone. I feel like I'm in, in a pretty good spot. Like I can take out anyone in the world. 전제되는 사람은 테란 선수들이 제일 전제되고 나머지는 다 비슷할 것 같아요. 아무래도 성주나 뭐 변현우 선수가 제일 견제돼요. 장점은 기공기가 탄탄한데 단점은 무난한 것 같아요. 지금은 그냥 체스파컵 남은 게 그거밖에 없기 때문에 좋은 성적 거두고 싶어요. 거기 포스 선수들이 편한 선수들만 다 떨궈 준다면 우승도 할수 있을 것 같아요. Welcome to the Kespa Cup. 2016 StarCraft 2 Kespa Cup. Welcome everybody to the Kespa Cup. As Young Young did just introduce you guys to, my name is Valdez, and with me is Wolf. We are about to start one of the best tournaments we've done all year long, and we've done quite a lot of good tournaments, Wolf. That's right. This tournament is really the culmination of a lot of work here in Korea as well, and we've got four players coming from the globe. We're gonna throw it back over here in just a minute to our amazing desk. We have set up. You and I are gonna be doing some. A little bit special today, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a moment. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's it's a Tuesday. You know, we're still getting lots of people in here to begin the night. And uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what this tournament is. There's a lot of money on the line. There's also points on the line. There's certain situations for uh, you know both foreign players and Korean players in terms of you know players could be moved around in terms of their seeds where they stand at the end. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in the tournament. But just for now, you guys can see. Uh, you know, the amount of points, the amount of money on the line, and of course here we have the amount of players that we have in here, 16 in total of uh, all different races. That's right, so we had seeded players from really four different groups. The 2016 Pro League top four players, we had two players from Europe, two players from NA, and then eight players going through a global qualifier. In that global qualifier, only Koreans did qualify. Just saw our map pool very briefly. It's something you'd expect if you play the ladder and watch competitive scenes. Here are our Korea standings right now. For Patience, Hero, Deer, and Classic, they still have opportunities to move around here and either make it or not. Um, as you can see, Trap, Rogue, Maro, and Pat already locked out of BlizzCon. Even getting first place in this tournament would not be enough. Yeah, and you guys can see here the players in green, the ones that are in this tournament. Unfortunately for Mar Marine Lord, even if he got first place, he cannot make it into BlizzCon, into the Global Championships this time around. But Nurcio Neeb tied there. He also got true. But here are our groups for the tournament. We're going to be doing Group A today. It's going to be Zest, Byun, Neeb, and Rogue. You guys can take a look at what we're going to be doing in the following days here as well and groups B, C, and D. Yep, all of our Western players are split into those four groups as well. So really each day you're going to get to see a little bit of the taste of the Western world. Here's tonight's group. Zest, Byun, Neeb, and Rogue. This will be the first time this year we have a foreign player really play uh, in this unregion-locked 
system here where Reebok Lee qualifies from uh, America. And our first matchup, of course, here is going to be Zastros Beyond. Both players, GSL champions. The things I really want to point out here, uh, the, the most important one, I think, is Beyond. You can see where how far he's come. In 2011, his best result was, of course, he got runner-up of Code A. And now, five years later, he's a GSL champion. Also, the Keck team powered prediction rate did put Beyond at 75% over 25% to win over Zest. Let's take a look at the other matchup we got coming up after that one. It's going to be Neeb versus Rogue, which is going to be really fun to see if Neeb can, you know, perform on the Korean stage here at an offline tournament. And of course, you guys can see some of their results as well. Uh, the big thing to note about Rogue and Neeb specifically is Neeb performed much better in his region than Rogue did in his, at, you know, 4th place to 28th. So let's see if someone who's really strong in NA can compete against a Korean player who's towards the bottom of the ladder, really, in terms of points. Yeah. So we are going to begin the tournament. Let's bring it over to the desk over here. <laughs> 보도록 하겠습니다. 저는 캐스터 성승헌이고요. 저와 함께 네 분이 오늘 부터 6일 동안 경기를 만나 보도록 하겠습니다. 울프 그리고 발데스, 박진영 그리고 고인규의 설련입니다. 먼저 글로벌의 설친 인사 나눠 볼까요? 안녕하세요. 글로벌 중계진 울프입니다. 안녕하세요. 저는 글로벌 중계진 발데스입니다. 네, 두 분의 좀 이야기를 한번 들어봤고. 자, 계속해서 so there you have it, guys. Just doing a little bit of an introduction here for the Korean stream. Welcome to the Kespa Cup. Oh! <laughs> Hello, guys. I'm Kanata, Korean uh, Grandmaster, random Grandmaster commentator. Thank you. He always slides in his ranking when he does his little <laughs> intros, okay? Yeah, I love it. It's so fun. But uh, really the fun of this is that, you know, everybody, all the casters over here, we've got like an L-shaped desk format. We're going to be doing it all together uh, here on the desk. So uh, it's going to carry over for all the interviews, for everything that we do for all the tournaments. So it's going to be a lot of fun. That's right. So if we have a foreign player, for example, uh, actually advance from any of these groups, uh, you and I will be interviewing him more directly and then uh, translating that interview back into Korean, which is the first time I've ever done anything like this on this scale. Yeah. So it's a little bit scary for me. My Korean is not perfect, actually, and uh, you might not even say fluent, depending on who you ask, but uh, it's good enough to ask basic questions and translate them. So um, if we have a you know Korean player advanced, which you know obviously we will in many of these groups no matter what, um, in fact, all of them, now that I think about it, uh, when yeah. we interview that player, the Koreans will mostly be doing the interviewing, but we'll ask some of our questions as well. So if you tweet us something you'd like to ask, perhaps if it's relevant, uh, we can ask that player uh, what he thinks about you know your question. Yeah, for sure. And go ahead, guys, if you are posting those questions at us or just on Twitter, go ahead and hashtag Kespa Cup because that's how we're going to be collecting those questions and just you know creating hype for this tournament and seeing what people are thinking uh, about this entire tournament. So make sure anytime you're tweeting, Hashtag Kespa Cup. Send us your questions, your comments, anything. You know, go need fighting even is cool. You know, anything really, guys. Just send it yeah. over to us. We really are using this hashtag uh, to get kind of all sorts of feedback from the tournament. So if you're looking for ways to, you know, give your feedback to us, I mean, obviously you can tweet at us, but if you want to give it to really all parties involved, ourselves, the players, uh, Kespa, and of course, Spot TV Games, then Kespa Cup, the hashtag is the way to do it because throughout the day, people will be clicking on that and looking at that and reading you guys' feedback. So please do so, especially, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit before you and I off uh, off camera. If you are a, a big personality as well and you're watching this, like a pro gamer or community member or whatever, when you use that hashtag, then um, your tweets are going to be at the top and we'll see those and we'd love to, you know, say what other pros are thinking about this tournament as well. Yeah, so it looks like we're wrapping it up here over at the desk. We're going to be getting into these games in just a bit, guys. As we said before, it is going to be Zest versus Beyond to start the night. And it's going to be a really fun matchup because even though Zest, he has been kind of out of shape, we haven't seen him for quite a while. He's been kind of out of, under the radar for about two, three weeks uh, ever since the uh, the Pro League Finals. And uh, But historically, his PVT has been quite fantastic, his best matchup. That's definitely true. Let's break down our maps here. Let's go through this map, take advantage to see what these two players chose. So, Pedos and Apotheosis and Dasan for Beyond Galactic Process and Frozen Temple for Zest. And the picks coming in at Frost for Zest. Beyond Counterpicking Sejong and then New Gettysburg will be map three. So three maps you would expect to see. 
I think our vetoes will be pretty consistent throughout this tournament, I'd imagine. Frozen Temple and Galactic Process may be the two that sneak in at some point, but I think these three maps that you see chosen for almost every match will be the norm. Yeah, for sure. It's 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 kind of, you know, pretty balanced for both of these players, I'd say. Interesting that uh, Zest goes ahead and picks Frost first over New Gettysburg. A lot of people saying New Gettysburg pretty good for Protoss, but King Angel Station definitely the pick here for Beyond. And uh, it kind of makes sense. And of course, if you guys, you know, we were kind of speeding through all the CGs that we had, but this is going to be dual tournament format. So it's going to be a DSL format where we go, you know, the, the two matches in the beginning, then a winners and losers, losers match, and then you get the final match. And we decide two players to get out of Group A in that way. You know, same sort of format you'd have in the GSL or the SSL. Just the mm -hmm. same four player group, double elimination, dual tournament. So. We're gonna jump into this one pretty soon here. Let's announce Zest first. As you said, we haven't seen him since the Pro League Grand Finals, and in that very finals, he actually cannon rushed and failed uh, versus Trap. So when you look back at that, it seems like maybe even at that time, he was not entirely confident in his form. We haven't seen him for a while before that either as he fell out of both Star Leagues. Bianca, on the other hand, dropped out to Classic in the SSL, uh, dropped out to Dark in the cross finals, but he did win GSL off of this very same matchup versus SOS, who obviously is not only in great form in PVT, but also was preparing for PVT as far back as the Pro League finals where he hit Jokchi in that entry format. Yeah, very true, and we had kind of the graphic come up where it's champion versus champion. Zess, of course, winning season one, Beyond winning season two of the GSL. Beyond go! Who's that? I, oh. I half expected that to be rapid. <laughs> I'm like, he would make a sign that is that simple, but just, you know, kind of interesting as well. I think the guy's sign next to her said raising them right, and that's damn straight. Okay, yeah. raising them right, bringing your kids down to Casper Cup. That is the way to do it. That is raising them right in a nutshell. Guys, we do have English headsets here uh, in the studio, so if you do come down and you bring some headphones, all you can do is plug them in, and you can listen to our commentary directly here in the studio. So the players need a little bit more time to get their settings confirmed here and ready. Things got a little bit hectic today at the beginning uh, with rehearsals, as obviously we are doing things in two languages here live in the studio, so it obviously gets a little yeah. bit more complicated. <laughs> But it was fun, you know, even just to begin the night, uh, get a little bit of a, a different taste of what uh, production could be like if we mix the, the two different sides of it over here. Generally, it's very separated. You know, there was that one time, what was it, 2014, where they asked you on stage what you thought yeah, uh, about a, a certain King. thing. Yeah, about Marine King, and you had to answer in Korean. There was like one or two times like that, but yeah. outside of that, this is going to be very inclusive. Uh, you know, throughout the entire tournament. It's not just a couple of questions here and there. I'm probably going to get really nervous and make a lot of mistakes, but we'll see what happens. I'm excited. It's going to be all in good fun, Wolf. That's right. <laughs> um, we'll see how this one works out. Oh, speaking of nerves, I hope that Neve can keep his nerves together here. It's his first time playing a Korean match, and there's a lot on the line pride-wise for him. Obviously, when you look at uh, a foreign player in a group of four like this, I mean, we're looking at two champions. Not only two champions, but Zess is a, a multi-time GSL winner. It was rapid himself. <laughs> Big Astro. Oh, man. And uh, I love that face. Are you dealing with someone who's never played in a, a Korean league before? Play against someone who's won two and someone who's won the most recent. I mean, this is the two players who are set to play right now, but if he beats Rogue, he will face one of them. And even if uh, he loses, he will face one of them just the same. So. He's about to have to face these these champions, and really Rogue is as easy as opponent up the three. Just to kind of give the overarching story yeah. of the group here since we have some time. I think for Neeb, what he wants the most is, you know, play a good PvZ. His PvZ is fantastic, okay? I, I'd say his PvT is probably his weakest matchup because I think PvP is actually his best. But uh, especially in the foreign scene, he kind of just goes adepts and he kills Zergs over and over and over again. I don't think it's going to be that easy against Rogue, but I still feel like he's got a great understanding of the matchup. So he wants to beat Rogue and then hope that Zest gets out of the other side and defeats Bion somehow, some way. And then maybe he can even get out in first. So guys, we are starting up the game. We're going to get into game number one now of Zest versus Bion.
Jeez, here we go, guys. Jumping into game number one on Frost. Up in the top left, in the red, the Protoss player from KT, it is Zest. And his opponent to the bottom left, in green, the Terran player who is currently teamless, the defending GSL champion, it is Bjorn. And let's talk about Bjorn's style in this match. When you look at him stylistically from his results versus Deer and also against SOS, with the exception of game one of the grand finals where he did do uh, a proxy, without that, he is really looking to just win these games not with macro, but with micro. His control is impeccable. He's out microing adepts. He makes adepts look like they're melee units with how he kites, <laughs> with how he controls these battles. Yeah. And sometimes you can look at an army of the of the Terran player and say, well, this Protoss army's got some AOE. You know, it's a larger Protoss army. But Bjorn makes it feel so small with how well he controls. And that's not only the story of this matchup, but also the matchup against Zerg. But when we focus on this one, he makes good decisions. He does a lot of drop harass, but it comes down to his control. I think that's the most important thing for him, uh, you know, in this matchup. Yeah, definitely very, very true. And even going straight into a quick factory here with that quick gas, he's going to get that right away. So wants to start off the game aggressive, try to out micro Zest, you know, go for some kind of drop, maybe Widow Mines, maybe a Marine Widow Mine drop, something like this. We'll have to wait and see exactly what he wants to do here. And uh, Zest has always been, you know, that kind of style where he would... I remember in the beginning when he was really in good form, he kind of made DTs very popular where you could just go DTs and harass the Terran in his base and take the earliest third base of all time. If you don't go for DTs, you can also harass with the Depths, put on an immense amount of pressure, get a very early third base, and there wasn't much that the Terran could do. He was very famous for doing this on uh, Dust Towers. Him and Stats, the two KT Protoss, has just made Terrans look silly over and over and over again, despite taking very early third bases that the Terrans could not uh, really punish at all and getting so far ahead going for a very heavy gateway style early on and then just you know using their macro and their fundamentals to get, get ahead like that. Yeah and, and with the advent of the meta change to where we see Terrans lifting their main CCs now more often than not um, you have a lot less scans and we're desperately trying to drop mules. DTs become very powerful they're also very powerful in base trade scenarios which happen a lot in this matchup right now so um, the, the DT tech you're talking about, very important here, and with the Robo and Twilight Council, it's a possibility, although unlikely. The Hellion here will uh, stop this pylon from going up, so still a little bit of harass. Will go off with this Mothership Core, in fact, will delay the CC. Hellion's going across for a little bit of counter pressure, obviously the Mothership Core won't be there, but he should have enough units to minimize the damage. It's going to be about control here from our Protoss here, Zass to the top left. Four Marines versus this Mothership Core, not enough. Uh, DPS here, we'll have to recall, nearly loses that. He does take out two of them, and he is going to get it back in time to go for an overtime. I think he's got just barely enough. The yep. Italian's coming in, and they do get three kills in total, four probes, okay. Just a bit of damage, and he, he does force the Mothership Core back home, so... Zest looks like he wants to take the old school blink approach here. He uses blink to pressure the Terran while taking a third base. It's hard to counter attack, and with blink on the map, obviously drops become less powerful. They're a lot riskier once blink is out on the map. This is kind of a more old school, early 2016 approach to this matchup in Legacy of the Void, but it's still obviously very solid. This is kind of Zest's play style. He always wants to get some sort of edge with a little bit of harass, while then then you know moving forward economically, uh, taking a third base. Yeah, very true and. The Mothership Core, when it went in there, it saw the uh, tech lab on the factory, so maybe he was thinking perhaps a Cyclone going to come out here. But he's also very prepared for Liberators. Very, very prepared. He's already got pylons in position. Our observer keeps pointing out this one. Very important for stopping Liberators on that side. Also good for helping out against drops. So yep. we do see one coming across right now. but Looks like he's going to quickly react there and pick back up. Let's not forget the Mothership Core, since it's very low. Uh, re uh, re -gend. I'm having struggles here in English, so who knows what's going to happen when I speak <laughs> Korean later. Regen its uh, shields, but obviously does not regen health. So, um, you know, because it's not even wise to kill it and make a new one, it's very vulnerable. So he needs to be careful with its positioning. Gun's going to pick up a pylon here with good control. It should have no problems just sniping that here. And again, like I said, that's what Gun is known for, good control. In fact, he's been trying to grab an Adept, too. He's also drawn the attention away of this base, but the Mothership Core being in position with those pylons you talked about will deny this any damage at all. 
And very interestingly here, we're going to see Bion mixing in tanks into his composition. I, I wasn't sure if he was going to keep that on his factory, that tech lab, but he actually is going to be adding in some tanks. We'll see how many he wants to go for. It's just one right now. And it's kind of interesting because on this map, going for that third base, uh, you definitely can, you know, harass it a bit, especially with the, the medevac uh, in the... With the, the tank in the medevac, you can just pick it up and harass a lot of that mineral line. But we'll have to just wait and see. It looks like for now it's just a defensive tank. He is making a second one for now. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this tank account he's building will be quite helpful against the six gateway adept attack that Zest is preparing back at home. Obviously, Stim and Plus One will be quite helpful against this too. We'll have all these tools to kill these adepts, which don't have a large amount of hit points um, faster. And obviously, the AoE damage of the tanks will be quite helpful in doing that. You need to kill the Adept Army quickly because with its attack speed, it deals damage so quickly. The, the, you fight usually snowballs one way or another. You know, the Marine Army with tank support destroys the Adepts very quickly. The Frost has to back off and they've lost too much. Or the Terran Army just gets ripped apart. SVs are useless to help defend. And then usually the game ends with this many gateways. You know, six coming up here. Glaive's finished up now as well. The Protoss army is already moving out. He has that prism. This is going to be a very difficult attack to stop, and he will lose this first Widowmine. Glaive's done in 10. And don't forget, Blink is on the table here as well. So, I mean, using these tank evacs not going to be, obviously, very useful Yeah. Um, as much as perhaps and they would be. You can tell that this is a very specific practice build from Zest. He's purposely taking probes out of gas and not taking the fourth gas at his natural. And uh, none of the gases, of course, at his third, because he just wants to get out a lot of these units, as many as possible. Very good positioning on this uh, Liberator here. In fact, will still get one Stalker. That was a good reaction there by Bion. Obviously, you want to get more than that, but uh, all things considered, that was well done. Now moving out here with these Marines. He wants to snipe oh. this Prism. Slow reaction from Zest. He will get the Prism here. And that means no more reinforcements in this attack. I don't think he can execute it anymore. He's going to try to go for slow warp ends potentially with this pylon, but I can't imagine that will be very successful. I think it's time to transition. Although Zest thinks otherwise, he's going to add a, a warp prism and uh, I think probably continue the attack, and not, not making a fourth. You can see the approach that Bion is taking as well. Just hold off the attack as well as possible. Try not to take any damage with these tanks and go for a third CC. You were talking about that style where you're lifting your main. No, Bion is very comfortable to just hold on, play a little bit from behind, you know, let Zesk get his third base a lot more ahead of you, but just defend. Uh, as well as possible, maybe come out here and harass him. But he's got to be careful, though. There's a lot of adepts right here. He doesn't have combat shields yet either. Priest stims, and his army gets caught. Siege tanks with a good angle here. But this is the shredding I'm talking about. The attack speed on these adepts allows them to kill Marines so quickly. The stalkers blink in as well. And the entirety of Byun's army is washed away. The adepts are not done yet either. Coming in here, this time without a lot of support. This is going to be a good trade for Byun, in fact. Yeah, I feel like Zest is almost overcommitting here. Yeah. You know, he, he took a large chunk of that army away, and he was very, very far ahead. Then he just threw away a lot of his adepts in there. Uh, he's going to go down and check this third base and see that there still is no landed third base, and he immediately starts a fourth. Imagine if he had just backed off without just overstepping that little bit. If he had just taken that great fight in the middle of the map, catching Bion there, and just backed off, he would be even more ahead. But I feel like he still is in a de very good spot here against Bion. I completely agree. Uh, Bion uh, scouted that third base with a uh, commsat sweep. So he knows that this base is basically fully saturated, has been for a long time. He knew it was there, but he wanted to know how many probes, how long, how many gases. So you get all that information now, and that's going to be pretty frustrating. It's going to be uh, the kind of realization where you knew you were probably a little bit behind, but now you know just how much and how desperately you need to get another base off. And uh, the third TC is moving down now to that 6 o'clock, and very soon we'll probably be seeing that lift I'm talking about with the main base going to the 4th. Uh, but he needs to get damage done before then, as the rest of that base is mining out. He is going to be up a set of upgrades here with the armor and the attack versus just, just the armor. And uh, he has a fierce army, but he needs to start using it to harass and find damage, because as is right now, all he's been able to do is kill pylons, uh, you know, around the edges yeah. of the map. You can tell he's he's adding in a bunch more widow mines into the composition. He was making two at a time there for just a bit. Goes up to four. Uh, going to be very important unit against this heavy adept style that Zest is going for. 
And uh, of course, also adding in the Liberators. The tanks are a very interesting addition. It's kind of left over from the beginning, but they're a great backline to you know do extra AOE against the Adepts and just support your army and your Liberators as well. Keep he, those Stalkers away. He wants to fight here while there's no real AOE in this Protoss army. The Liberation Zone's here, not placed to deal with the Adepts. That one tank not landed finally is here. We even have the Warp Prism coming in. Archon's actually being hallucinated here to tank a little bit of extra damage. This Bio army is just being pushed back. The tanks go down. A huge Warp and of 10 more Adepts comes in as well. And Bionni's going to try to show some of that kiting I was talking about earlier, where he's just so good at microing, but the numbers against him this time might be too great. There's the Shaden into Liberation Zones, mind you. Yeah, always scary. You never want to fight underneath Liberation Zones, and Zest showing a, a bit more overconfidence going in there. I feel like this time it's more granted, for sure, but I feel like now you back off and, you know, get a couple more warp ins here. You're up an entire base. Look at his uh, minerals in his gas, actually. He's not quite multitasking as well as we've seen him in the past. He does warp in 10 stalkers, so that is a good way to get rid of all of that bank. Yeah, I wonder what he's really chrono boosting back at home. It feels like he's not chrono boosting gates, otherwise those would not be lining up 10 every time. Okay, two Widow Mines here in position. The Shades come in. One decent Widow Mine shot here. The Liberators, there's not enough of them here. There's a lot of anti-air in these Stalkers. He has to back away from the Liberation Zone, but he kills so many SCVs. This is amazing for Zest. All he really needs to do is try to force this CC away. Does not want to go up the ramp, doesn't need to. And he's starting to take such a huge economic lead. The one thing he's missing really is that AOE damage, though. Is he ever going to transition into Storms or I mean, Colossi? If he wins here, he doesn't need to. He's had the bank of gas to go for it. I understand he's saving a lot of his gas and his minerals to just get consistent warp ins. I guess he feels like he has enough of an advantage. He's going to come in here once again. Liberator's not in position. Yeah, Liberator's now in position, though. There's a little bit of bio left over underneath. But the issue here is there's enough stalkers to kill Liberators, and there's so much on the ground, it doesn't matter. Units lifted into Medivacs, so there's an Observer for Vision. Gun has to lift this CC, and already here in Game 1, it looks like we may have a bit of an upset with Zest taking Game Number 1. Ten more Adepts warped in, and he now doubles the supply. GG! GG. Zest taking Game Number 1 in a very, you know, just straightforward macro game. Zest using that, uh, that type of style that we were talking about, just going very aggressive, getting that very early third base, and there was not much that Byung could do, so... You know, this is what happens in this kind of format. It's a best of three, already beyond down one game. He could, you know, just go down here and have to play from the loser's match. But uh, we are going to be going into King Stadium Station here for map number two, a map that Byun should feel pretty comfortable on. That's right. Uh, this was Zest's map choice as well.